Now that the holidays are upon us, you will no doubt hear some Christians getting upset about the secular world wanting to take Christ out of Christmas. The truth is you can't take Christ out of Christmas or anything else for that matter. Whether we realize it or not, overwhelming influence of our culture is built upon principles and ideas that come from this man, Jesus. Even if we take away his divinity, we must admit that Jesus' words and life continue to haunt and challenge humanity. His influence has swept over history like the tail of a comet, bringing with it his inspiration of art, science, government, medicine, and education. No one has ever taught humans more about dignity, compassion, forgiveness, and hope than Jesus. Think about it. It's Jesus' name that desperate people pray to, grateful people worship, and angry people swear by. Major cities in our country are named after followers of Jesus or Christian ideas, as are hospitals, schools, and even roads. There's a good chance that even your name is influenced by Christianity. The Bible is the most printed and sold book of all time, despite regular attempts by world leaders to censor it from civilization throughout history. Jesus is the most painted man in history, even though we have no record of what he actually looked like. Even so, he has one of the most recognized faces in all the world. Countless actors have portrayed him in movies, including Jim Caviezel and Christian Bale, both who incidentally have names produced from Christian roots. Jesus never led an army or held an office, and he claimed that his kingdom was not of this world, and yet he inspired the concept of limited government and common law, and has given tribute in our very own constitution, stating, We are endowed by our Creator. Jesus changed the socioeconomic norms. He taught that women and children were not property. The very ideal of chivalry comes from Jesus. From Christianity, the act of forgiveness went from being a sign of weakness to an act of moral beauty. The very virtue of humility scorned in the ancient world is championed in the cross of Jesus Christ. Your birthday is marked in time by using the number of years from Jesus' birth. Something about Him keeps prodding people to do what they would rather not. His name divides, but it also unifies. Even the Bible claims that this simple poor carpenter has the name above all names. When Jesus broke into history, He changed things and He still changes things today. All of creation can't help but ask the same question the disciples were once recorded as asking, Who is this man? Morning, Fort Church. How are you? Good. I hope you had a good Thanksgiving. Mine was awesome. We moved house this week, and so I got my family here finally with me, and uh, we're going to be under the same roof. Yeah, I'm excited about that. Yeah. It, uh, it, was, uh, it was a lot of work, though. My back's a little achy, but, uh, but that's all right. In the midst of all of it, though, you get to see uh, all the, this week, all the Christmas lights begin to come up, and everybody's getting excited about Christmas. A lot of people, uh, if now there's some of those crazy folks have already put their Christmas tree up, but you know, the, some of them, some Thanksgiving weekend after you have your turkey, then you then you put up your Christmas tree, and and uh, folks have been out uh, shopping already. Things are going to be different for the next month. You you won't have to you won't have to wonder about the influence of Jesus for the next month because all around you there's going to be signs of Christmas time. The the traffic is going to be up. People are going to be out shopping. You're going to be spending money that later on you'll regret you would spend you know um, some people even do things so crazy they'll they'll go out in, in the middle of the night in matching monogram shirts to go Black Friday shopping uh, that that wild all right because uh, because of Christmas they're excited about Christmas and we know that the the reason for the season is Jesus right so so we know that um, and and doesn't matter what doesn't matter how much uh, people put the emphasis on other things on trees and presents and lights we know it's all about Jesus you can't get away from the influence of Jesus and and even if even if you took all of that away even if you took away the trees and the presents and the lights and the ornaments and all the food, if you took all that away, the influence of Jesus would still be incredibly strong in the world, just like we saw in the video there. Jesus' impact on the world is, uh, is incredible. It's pervasive. It's everywhere you go. It's everywhere you turn. And, uh, and the institutions that we saw uh, that have been created because of the ideals of Jesus, because of the things Jesus taught, because of the things Jesus stood for, are all around us. And although we may 
want to say the world is just, is just going to hell. It's, it's going the wrong way. Um, the influence of Jesus still cannot be denied. It doesn't matter what your political leanings or views are or what you think about kids these days. It doesn't matter. The influence of Jesus is still pervasive in the world. You cannot get around the influence of Jesus. Why is that? Why is that? That is because a little over 2,000 years ago, something really happened. A historical event took place. God came from heaven and took on human flesh, and he was born in a manger, in a, in a, in a barn in a city called Bethlehem. God left heaven, and he was born as a little baby. It's a real historical event. It's not, it's not a story. It's not, it's not a myth. It's not a philosophy. Something really happened. Something really happened. God came from heaven and became human flesh. Now, that's a big deal, all right? That's a big deal. Now, I want you to imagine now. Uh, imagine heaven, the things that you've heard good about it. Now, maybe you just got now, right now, you're just picturing clouds and harps and all that. But listen, in the Bible, it talks about heaven as uh, a city. It talks about it as real stuff, all right? It's going to be good. It's it, as good as you can imagine it. It's going to be better. The good parts of this life without all the, the, the anger and out all the jealousies and that, you know, just imagine without the bad parts, but all the good, and that's heaven, right? And so he leaves heaven. And he comes and he's born in this very humble circumstance. Now, I imagine if I asked this room, would you like to go back and redo part of your life? Most of you would say, oh yeah, I'll take that, right? Now, would you take it if you had to come back as a newborn? Now listen, imagine that. Now you come back completely helpless. Right? All right. You, are com you are completely helpless. Helpless. It's as humble a state as you can possibly be. You have no power. You, if you're going to get fed, it's because somebody's going to feed you. If you're going to move, it's because somebody's going to move you. If, if your head's not going to wobble around while they're moving you, they got to hold it up, right? If you're going to get changed, somebody's got to change you, all right? It is completely humble. It's not, listen, it's not just that he came and he was born in a barn and that there were donkeys and cows around. This is a, this is a, so helpless a state to be in. Now, this is, this is the God who spoke and created the universe. Um, the Bible says in, in Matthew that he came so that he could be with us. And uh, as the angels foretold the, the coming of Jesus, uh, spoke to Joseph and said, his name will be Emmanuel, which means God with us. He leaves heaven to come and to be with us, really be with us, face to face with us. He, he, he gets down to our level. Um, you know, when you if, you, if you want kids to like you, right? If you want, want a kid to really like you, you don't stand over them, right? I mean, that's intimidating for a child. You stand over them, looking over them, and, you know, kids see me coming, big old man, ooh, you know? But, but if you just get down, right, if you sit on the floor and you play the cars or the blocks or whatever, it's a whole different thing, right, because you're down on their level. And God comes down to be with us, with us. Why does he do that? Why does he do that? Why does he come down as a real human being, not, not just a story, not just a myth? Some people, some people said that Jesus wasn't actually human, that he was sort of a, a ghostly spiritual figure that, you know, nobody ever touched him and his feet never actually touched the ground. No, no, no. He's fully human, the Bible says. Why? Why does he come a real person in a real time in history? The reason is because you and I have real problems. We've got real problems that needed a real solution. You and I have real problems. We've got, re we've got real marriage problems. We've got real problems raising our children. We've got real financial problems. We've got real problems with addiction. We've got real problems with anger. We've got real problems with selfishness and greed. And all those things, all those things, they impact our lives in a real way. 
And they bust up marriages. People lose their homes. Relationships are ended, right? Wars are started. Real problems. And so God comes to help us in a real way. In a real way. What does he, what does he give up when he leaves heaven? In Hebrews chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1, if you want to look there, um, it says, in the past... God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. All right, so no, no longer through somebody else's mouth, no longer through a, a vision or a dream or a prophet, but now face to face, he comes and he speaks. He comes and he, he comes to be with his people. He come and he's spoken to us by his son. Now, whom he appointed the heir of all things. This is what he leaves in heaven. This is who he is, all right, to come and be born in this humble circumstances. Uh, he is appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty of heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. This is not another man, all right? This is not some other spiritual being. This is God in the flesh, all right? The exact radiance of the glory of God. He leaves heaven and he lives this perfect, sinless, real life and then he returns back to reign in heaven. Why does he come? He comes to provide a real solution to our real problems. In, uh, if you turn over in uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, it says, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power over death. See, he, he looks on you and he doesn't, he's not going to stand off at a distance and shout for you to, to do this or to do that. He's not just sending you a letter to tell you how to correct your behavior. He's coming, and he's going to fully identify with you. He's going to be like you so that he can truly help you. That's, that's a big deal. That's a big deal that, that somebody, that not just somebody, but that God cares enough about your real problems that he came to provide a real solution. People give you all kinds of advice, you know, people will offer you help, um, and sometimes you just wish that they'd keep it to themselves. You get a lot of bad advice in life, you know. Sometimes the worst thing that somebody could tell you is, uh, hey, just, just follow your heart, right? Because you're thinking, I'm, I think my heart got me right here where I am in this bad spot. I'm, you know, just... Just trust yourself. I'm like, uh, that hasn't been working out, right? Um, you, need, you need real real solutions, real help. Um, I, I, There's a little funny story. Uh, you, you might have heard it, but uh, it's a, about a truck driver who's driving under a um, railroad overpass, and he, he comes down. There's just a certain amount of clearance, and he didn't think much about it. Figured he probably had enough room, and he's just driving under. He goes, all right, and he's stuck right under the, the overpass there, and uh, and he tries to tries to keep going. He can't keep going. He tries to put it in reverse. He tries to back up. He can't go back, and uh, so the traffic gets backed up. The police come in and they're got the lights flashing and and uh, blocking up the traffic, and it's getting you know longer and longer back behind him. So they're trying to find a way to get this truck out of here. They call in a tow truck and they're gonna you know grab a hold of it and pull it out from under there. And somebody goes, whoa whoa whoa, what about the bridge? You know what kind of damage are you gonna do to the bridge? They say, well hold on, let's call the city engineer. And so they call the city engineer, bring the city engineer over, and he's assessing what kind of damage is gonna be done to the bridge if they pull it out. And uh, and then they call. They say, well I don't know we might damage the bridge too much and then the trains will fall in and and so they said well all right call the dot maybe there's something we can do you know underneath with the road and so they call the dot and the dot guys come and there's six or eight of them and they come they get out of the truck and they come over and one of them says hey grab the shovel and he goes why do we need this shovel he said well somebody's got to have that shovel to lean on right so and so um there's not any dot guys in here huh? 
All right, so um, got like a, oh, all right. So, uh, you know, somebody's always leaning on that shovel. And, uh, and so they come and they're looking, can we dig it out or something? And, and bigger crowds gathering up. And, and one of the guys is, uh, I think they brought in the fire department. And one of the guys is walking by the, by the crowd there. And this kid on his bicycle says, hey, hey, mister, why don't you let the air out of that tire? And the guy goes, huh? What? Why don't you let the air out of the tires? Good idea. <laughs> a silly illustration, but you know, we, we, need a, we need a real solution to a real problem, right? Um, you know, in ministry, you know, you're around church, people come with their, with their real problems. Sometimes I feel bad because we can't, we, can't, we can't meet every need. You know, people come and they, they I, I need, I need money. I need money for this, this bill. I need money for this food, you know. And if you can't meet that need, you know, I feel, feel genuinely bad, you know. You, you, you go, I, and, and you say, I can't do this. I know it's your need, but I can't do that. I, and you say this, you go, I will, I will pray for you, and I really will. I mean, I really will, and I, I believe there's power in prayer, and it's good. But for that person in that moment, what they need is money, Right? And I feel bad. Now, for you and I, we have a problem that affects every part of our lives. The Bible calls the problem sin. We've talked about it in the past. And it's, it's that we have turned from God's way and we go our own way. And the effect of sin on our lives and on our family's lives and on the world is, is all over. We, we are not as we should be. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to search very far to, to understand that. You just you look in the mirror and you think about the ways that you wish, you wish that you were more loving. You wish that you were more kind. You wish that you were more sacrificial in, in your marriage and, or with your kids. Or um, you, wish, uh, you wish that your addictions didn't hold on to you. You wish you could power your way through them. You wish you were more patient. You know that there's a better way Right? And you know that your sin, your struggle, your brokenness is hurting you and hurting the people around you. These are real issues, real brokenness. And Jesus comes to provide a real solution to those things. He takes on flesh and blood ultimately so that he can give his life for your life. The things that are, that are hurting your real life he comes and he's going to take all of that upon his shoulders, upon his real body, all right? It says um, in uh, verse 14 of chapter 2, it says, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of, over death and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. He's, he's going to take our death. He's going to give his life for our life. Really. He's really, he really did it. It says in verse 17, for this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. The high priest language, you may not, may not know much about the high priest in the Old Testament. What the high priest did is they went in to the presence of God, into the, the holy of holies where, where God's presence was supposed to be in the tabernacle or the temple, and they went in and they made sacrifice for the people. And here, Jesus is the one who goes before God for you. We no longer need a high priest Jesus goes in before God for us on our behalf. And it says, uh, so that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Atonement is a covering, right? Covers the sins. That's what I need. I need when God looks at me, I need, I need my sins to be covered. I don't want him to see my sins. Because my sins condemn me. They absolutely do. 
Now, I can try and rationalize it, and I can try, but I, listen, I know me. I know what I've done. I know what I've willingly done. I know that from the times that I knew better, and I did it anyway, I know my sins condemn me. And I need a covering. And there's no better covering than Jesus. The sinless, real life of Jesus. You know what? He not only died to give you life, he lived a sinless life for you. That's, that's an amazing truth right there. He lived a sinless life for you. And now this, this, is really, this is really cool, all right? Verse 18, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. You talk about Jesus providing real help to real problems. You read this verse and you think about the things that I still struggle with, the temptations that I have. And you think, did Jesus really suffer in temptation? Because sometimes I feel like I suffer in temptation, trying to, trying to withhold, you know, trying to not step into sin, trying to keep myself from it, trying to do the right thing. Did Jesus really suffer in temptation? Do you think? I mean, he's God. But don't forget, he's fully human, fully flesh and blood. You think, well, he can't be tempted like me. He's not tempted, he's not tempted, to, tempted to drugs, and he's not tempted to alcohol, and he's not tempted to, to lust, and he's not tempted to greed. He's, he, he's Jesus. He's not tempted like me. And I, I tell you, think for just a minute. Think for just a minute about the life that Jesus had from beginning as just an infant, but growing up and, and having real humanity in that he grew up in a household where he had some younger brothers. Who in here did not want to punch their younger brother at some point, all right? All right. In real anger, like, like maybe had the thought, I wish you had never been born, right? Not Jesus, no. Temptation was real. You think his little brothers weren't aggravating? Of course they were. As he grew up into his teenage years and began to work as a carpenter, struggle through that, and the difficulty of work and learning a trade, and he wasn't tempted to take shortcuts, tempted to be lazy. Sure he was. But he didn't. He always did as he was supposed to do. He always followed through. You know, um, when he entered into his public ministry, about the age of 30, he began to teach, and he began to teach in such a way that people were drawn to him. People, people, people heard him speak, and they wow, this guy has got authority. He's got power. There's something to him. And so people were drawn to him. He healed people. And so people wanted to come, and they wanted to be healed. They wanted to hear him. And so at times, there were thousands of people gathered around to hear him. You think that doesn't, you think that doesn't tempt you to be prideful? You think there weren't people trying to trying to take advantage of Jesus to maybe use money to, to gain something from him? You think there weren't people who admired him and wanted to get close to him in inappropriate ways? Of course there were. But he never gave in. He held strong. It was not, apparently not easy. He suffered in temptation. The, the purest picture of that is found in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's an olive garden, but it's the night when Jesus was arrested and he would be, go to the cross and be crucified. He had his disciples there with him at night in this, in this olive garden and uh, olive grove, and, and he's there and he, he kneels down and he begins to pray. He begins to pray and he prays for his disciples prays for his disciples there, and he prays that God would protect them. And then he prays for you and I. He says for those that would believe through his disciples. That's you and I. He prays for us at that time. 
And he's praying with this crazy intensity, really intense prayers. The Bible says that he's so intense in these prayers that actual blood comes from his pores. He sweats blood. As he begins to pray, Father, if there's any way that this cup, and what he's talking about in the Old Testament, it's this cup of God's wrath, that God's, God's wrath, God's, God's due anger towards sin. These, God, God can't stand sin. It's not like he's, he's just angry at you because you don't obey him. He can't stand that it destroys lives, that it hurts people, that, that and he can't stand it. And, and so Jesus says, God, if there's any way that you can take this, this cup from me, he says, but not, not my will, yours. What's he talking about? He's talking about what's going to come in the next day. The, the, the next day, this real man, this real flesh and blood man is going to be beaten. He's going to be accused falsely. He's going to be nailed to a cross. And he's going to die. And all of that's bad. All of that is so bad. But this cup he's talking about, is that all of our brokenness, all of our sin, all the hurt that has come uh, on you and all that, that, you have, that you've caused other people, all of it is gonna be put on him on the cross in his physical body where we deserved punishment, where we deserved death, the right, the right outcome for our sin he takes it upon himself. He takes it all, all of yours. You, you in here who think that there's no way, there's no way, I'm so far away from that perfection that Jesus is, no way he took mine. Yes, the sins of the whole world he bore upon his body on the cross, his real body. There in the garden where he says, God, if there's any way, because he knows how bad it's going to be, he knows how rough it's going to be, if there's any way that you could take it, but he says, not my will, but your will. It's God's will to save those who would trust him and believe. It's God's will that you would be rescued from your sin. It's God's will that you would have new life and a new hope in him. That's awesome. That's incredible. And you know why? You know why it comes to pass? You know why you still have that opportunity today? Because in that garden, Jesus didn't walk away. Jesus didn't turn his back, but he looked forward to you and to your salvation and you sitting here today living for him or receiving him for the first time. And he said, God, not my will, but yours. See, we needed a real savior because we've got a real problem in sin. And we needed a real solution. And that solution is Jesus Christ. And he says that all who believe in him, all who trust in him, will not perish but will have everlasting life. The death that he bore on the cross now gives you life. Will you receive it? Will you receive it? Let's bow our head and close our eyes.